Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Today we are going to discuss, I've been having conversations this last week with students regarding uh, marriage and um, how to go about finding somebody. And we were having a few discussions. So what we'll do today is, why not talk about that? So let's deal with the mitzvah of marriage. So I like to focus on choosing uh, a suitable victim, uh, I mean a partner, and um, and maybe, just maybe, um, maybe another time we could actually go into the deeper Kabbalistic reasoning uh, behind having children and the obligation to attempt to have children. But with your permission, I'd like to focus on one aspect of the mitzvah of getting married. So how do you choose a suitable partner for marriage? So this is relevant for you if you're not married, by the way. This is also relevant to you if you are married. And we want to understand the nature of the mitzvah of marriage itself. Okay, we want to understand the nature of the mitzvah of marriage. And by the way, even if you've been married for a long time, this is a re it's relevant to you because you may be able to help your children get married. And one of the mitzvahs of a parent, by the way, is to help a child get married, obviously. And if you're a teacher, if you're a rabbi, if you're a rebbitzin, obviously, um, I think you need to know this as well. And you may need to help people along the path uh, on their journey. Anyway, uh, so let's study this as a mitzvah, and then we'll switch gears and deal with the practicalities. Uh, how do you actually go about finding somebody to marry? And um, I hope this topic is okay with, um, with all of you. So let's approach the mitzvah of marriage from the perspective of trying to find a suitable partner. First of all, let me remind you that marriage is a mitzvah. Marriage is a mitzvah. It's a commandment. It's not an option. One of the most interesting observations that we can make about the commandment to marry is that it's a man's mitzvah. So let me take one step back. I know we live in a, in a gender-confused uh, generation. Again, I'm trying to be very sensitive, um, really, not, not saying anything negative about anybody. I'm really not. Uh, so I'm not going to uh, go into that discussion regarding uh, people who identify as different sexes. But I'm talking about in Judaism what we call kiddushin, which means a Jewish marriage. And there's another mitzvah, right, to marry and produce children for non-Jews, by the way, as well. And I'm not relating to us specifically today. I'm relating to the Jewish mitzvah, which is called kiddushin, which is the mitzvah of two Jews to reconstitute that original spiritual oneness that they represented in the spiritual world. So together, I'll try, to, um, I'll try to explain that. And so it requires, obviously, a man and a woman. In Jewish thinking, the definition of marriage, when they talk about same-sex marriage, for example, in Jewish thinking, that's, that's, that's a ridiculous concept. Not that two people of the same sex can have a wonderful relationship. Of course they can. But it doesn't fit the definition of marriage. You can have two wonderful, again, you can have a wonderful same-sex relationship. Why not? By the way, we have sources who tell us that the relationship, the love between David and Jonathan was deeper than the love between a man and a woman. Absolutely. There's no reason why they can't be. Why not? But that's not called marriage. That's not called kiddushin. So let's talk about the mitzvah of a man and a woman reconstituting that complementary pair, that fertile complementary pair that requires a man and a woman. And that's the mitzvah of marriage. Now, the first, the first thing to note is it is a man's mitzvah. It is a male mitzvah. So let's discuss that and try to understand why that's the case. After all, don't it take two to tango? Um, isn't, it, isn't it strange that... It's strange that a man should have a mitzvah, which involves someone else, yet she doesn't have the same mitzvah? I mean, that makes it very unbalanced. So here's a man. He's importuning some unwilling, unwilling female to put up with his nonsense and attentions for the rest of her life. When she can turn to him and say, well, this isn't what God necessarily wants for me. It's your problem, buddy. Why would the Torah do that? Why, why does the Torah predicate or, or postulate a mitzvah to a man, which requires a woman, by definition, 
and not give the woman the commandment to marry as well. By the way, I'm not saying that she doesn't fulfill a commandment if she marries. She's certainly fulfilling a commandment if she brings children into the world. It's an, an incredible spiritual action and commandment. But technically speaking, she's not obliged to go out there and marry. And the question is why? So let me tell you a story. Pay, uh, please uh, pay attention because there's tremendous spiritual depth in this. And this should really be a myth, uh, an introduction to all mitzvahs. So some years ago, one of my rabbi's daughters wanted to meet with his saintly rabbi, a rabbi who I speak a lot about, Rabbi Moshe Shapiro. And my rabbi made it happen, and he, he and his daughter were sitting across the table from him. And she asked, she said to the rabbi, I have two questions for you. Question number one is, why don't I have a commandment to marry? As a Jewish girl, I want to do what Hashem wants me to do. And if he wants me to marry quite evidently, right? He would tell me to get married. But since he's not instructed me to marry, evidently, he's not too interested in this. Second question. Listen to this. Why was Eve, why was Chava cursed in an area that's optional? Let me explain her question. You know that Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve were cursed as consequences of their sin. Man, Adam, was cursed in a particular way. Now is not the time to go into his suffering. But woman was cursed with an array of curses. Ten curses, in fact. Anyway, Eve was cursed. The central feature of her curse was difficulty in pregnancy and pain in childbirth. That's what, that's what she was given as a curse. Again, she, she asked Rabbi Shapiro, why would God give Eve a curse that is optional? In other words, you see, man and woman pervert their way in the world as history begins. They make the classic cataclysmic catechism, error, and they derail all of human history. They offend their essence in the world, and they derail, again, just all of human history. Surely, the punishment should fit the crime. In other words, if they did something that deeply damages their essence, you expect the punishment, the consequence, the curse to be something of their essence as well. So why was Eve cursed in something that was ancillary, a side point, just optional? As if God was saying to her, you, because you sinned, you'll have uncomfortable pregnancies and pain and childbirth. But if you want to do it, right? If you don't want to do it, just don't do it. It's completely optional. That's very strange. So those were her two questions. Are we all together so far? Uh, it, yeah, yes, yes, Myrna, yes, that's, that, that's true. Okay, listen to the answer. Now, I'm telling you the answer of a great Jewish thinker, a great Jewish thinker, one of the greatest Talmudic and Torah minds of that generation. So here's what he said. He said that both of your questions are answered with the same answer. Of course, they're related questions, so they both have the same answer. So listen to what Ramosha Shapiro said. And here comes the principle. The principle is that mitzvahs are given only and always in your area of deficiency. So let me say that again. It's a major principle. Mitzvahs are strategies for fixing damage. Mitzvahs are always given to you to correct a problem. The Zohar calls mitzvahs etzahs. That means strategies for overcoming problems. So let me say it again. Mitzvahs are not some sort of spiritualized ethereal actions that put you in tune with the spiritual world. That, that may be that as well, right? They may be that as well. But the essence of a mitzvah is to fix a problem. Where you have an issue, the mitzvah comes in to fix it. Example, no one wants to give their money away to other people. The Torah says, okay, learn to be generous. Learn to do it. You have a commandment to give tzedakah. Or conversely, people would like to express themselves with sensual abandon, and the mitzvah is no. Control it and focus, and limit it in a correct fashion with your husband or wife. Mitzvahs are against natural tendencies. They're against childish, immoral, immature tendencies. The mitzvahs are there to correct problems. So again, this is very well known in Kabbalistic writing. Mitzvahs are there to fix a broken world. 
That's what the mitzvahs are. And of course, our work is necessary to fix the broken world. And again, this is, this is a long discussion. So let me give you a classic example to illustrate the principle. Here's the principle. Mitzvahs, <clears throat> mitzvahs are here to fix problems. And if you don't have a problem, you don't need a mitzvah. I'll give you an example. Since we're talking about women, let's give a womanly example. Do you know that women are obliged in all mitzvahs in the Torah with exactly the same stringency as men, except the positive mitzvahs that are time-bound? That are time-bound. So let me say that again. A negative mitzvah, like killing or stealing, women exactly the same prohibition as men, same obligation as men. But when it comes to a positive mitzvah that is occasioned by time, for example, wearing tefillin, which is a daytime mitzvah, wearing tzitzit, which is a, t- a daytime mitzvah, or any mitzvah that is occasioned by a time event or a time sequence or time period, women are exempt from those commandments. So any other positive mitzvah like charity, which is not bound by time, a woman has to do. But one that is bound by time, she's exempt. And the question is why? Again, there are many levels of explanation. And of course, the conventional one that's known, even by young children who have a Jewish education, it's because a woman has priorities. A mother has to take care of a small child who's dependent on her for, from, the, from moment to moment. And if that child needs attention, the mother can't be going off to sit in a sukkah or doing something else that her time requires. Um, and therefore, she can't be obliged to do that particular commandment. Now, that may be true. But it's a very, very superficial answer. I'll tell you a much more cogent and spiritual answer. Again, mitzvahs that are time-bound discipline you in time. The reason that the time occasion, right, that the, the time occasions the mitzvah is because you're required to be sensitive to the time and in that cycle of time to respond at that point in the time cycle with the correct spiritual activity. Women do not need to be locked into the time cycle of the world. They don't have that deficiency. Men are free-floating beings who are totally undisciplined time-wise. Women are already locked in. Time, by the way, Kabbalistically, Kabbalistically, time is the ultimate female dimension. And women resonate with time, with the time cycle. A monthly cycle of time in the world is a woman's cycle and her body's tuned to that cycle. A wo- right, the woman's hormonal cycle is so spiritualized that medicine does not even have a theory explaining it. Let me tell you what I mean. All known biological cycles throughout the whole world of biology, all known cycles are timed in resonance with some event. For example, day-night variation or, or seasonal changes or temperature variations. It is variations in the seasons or the times that occasion biological change. There's one exception, and that's the woman's hormonal cycle. It proceeds against the day-night variation across the seasons, across temperatures. It's not linked to anything in the universal framework of time other than the moon. Other than the moon. The woman's hormonal cycle resonates with the moon. Do you know that, <clears throat> that there are some Jewish women... This this used to be more common than today, but in a time when people used to resonate more with a Torah reality, which was much more, uh, again, this was much more common. And even today it it occurs, but some women have a monthly cycle that begins on the same date of the Hebrew month, whether it's a long month or a short month. It can have 29 days or 30 days. She'll start on the fourth of the month. Her ovary knows exactly what the moon is doing. Medicine doesn't even have a theory to explain that yet. Never mind an explanation, not even a theory. That means the woman's body is tuned to the universe to the universal time cycle. She doesn't need to be locked in and disciplined into the time cycle of the world. And therefore, she does need mitzvahs that uh, she does not need mitzvahs which are time bound. So let's go back to the principle. You're only given a mitzvah where you need it, where you naturally resonate with certain part of the spiritual universe. You don't need those mitzvahs. So let's come back to women and marriage. So Ramosha Shapiro said, the reason a woman has no mitzvah to marry, she's not deficient in that area. She understands it without a commandment. A woman understands the nature of a bonded relationship with a man. 
and in fertile time in and in fertile nature both in terms of fertility of the relationship itself and the love that's generated and the bond between two and the fertility issue of producing children so this is something that a woman is credited by the torah of understanding deeply and richly to the extent that she doesn't need to be told to do it so this is the answer to your question the reason a woman has no mitzvah to marry not because god doesn't want it but he feels that he can trust women to know it of themselves he doesn't have to batter them and beat them into doing it and of course Eve's curse was in an area that is of her essence. It's not optional at all. It's so, it's so much of your essence if you're a woman that you're trusted to understand what it means and to seek it and to fulfill it without needing to be commanded to do it. A man is not on that level in this area. He needs to be disciplined into it and forced into it in order to correct his own immaturity in this area. Okay, so it's a very beautiful pair of questions and beautiful singular answer, which covers them both. And therefore, the bottom line, of course, <clears throat> a woman is fulfilling her essence when she marries. No doubt about that at all, even though there's no formal mitzvah. So there are other answers to the question as well. I'll give you one practical one. And that is since pregnancy involves some pain and danger, the Torah does not command it. That's another answer that you'll find some, um, in some of our sources. After all, pregnancy is potentially a lethal risk, a small risk, but nevertheless a risk. And the, the Torah doesn't require a woman to do it. If she's brave and understands it and wants to do it, incredible. But the Torah never forces her to enter a situation which might put her in danger. So that's another take on the same subject. However, at the end of the day, it is a mitzvah that's fulfilled, even though it's technically the man who has an obligation to do it, and in the marital area, the man is always the active party and the woman is always the active recipient. That And that needs a deep understanding of what the nature of male and female is. And we've discussed previously the concept of the Torah being male and female, of the Torah being male and the mitzvahs being female. And we explored the male-female duality, uh, but this is the nature. And you'll, you'll notice that, <clears throat> that uh, all marital actions Sorry, a question just popped up. Okay, that's an interesting question. Why did God make childbirth lethal? God did not make childbirth lethal. I think your question's incorrect. The sin of Adam and Eve made childbirth lethal. There is no lethality in the world. I'm sure that you're all aware that Chazal say that when Adam and Eve were created, how were children born? people climbed onto a bed, right? Two people climbed onto a bed and three people climbed off. That's how conception and birth took place. Man and woman were together and the child is born immediately. There was no delay, there was no pain, there was no danger, but man and woman introduced death into the world. And so now the bringing of life into the world has a death risk as well. That's how we'll put it. But this is not directly our subject and we're not dealing with the sin of Adam and Eve today. <clears throat> okay, another question. All right, that's another good question. I was just asked, you know, if you'll forgive me, uh, I'm not going to answer you right now. I want to focus on the, on the immediate and practical aspects of marriage. That will take us off course. So, so this is a midst of finding a partner and reconstituting that original oneness. So let's talk about the practicality. How do you set about choosing someone who's suitable? I'll try and take an approach to this mitzvah and some of the practicalities involving psychology of marriage as well. So let's make a map, okay? Let's make a, a framework on, to, uh, on which to hang our discussion. And I think uh, the way it should be done is like this. You're a person who's ready to get married. Doesn't matter what your age is, it's still a mitzvah to marry. Whether you can or cannot have children, it's still a mitzvah to get married. <clears throat> How do you choose a potential partner? You meet someone and you want to assess whether they're suitable for marriage. How do you make that assessment? Let me suggest that you make a scheme. Okay, let me suggest that you make a scheme. So I make sure everybody's muted. Okay, you draw a red line. Above the red line, you put the essential variables. And below the red line, you put the negotiables. 
So that's a sensible way to size, to size up somebody for marriage. You can't judge all the variables at the same time, so you make priorities. So I would suggest to you that there are two non-negotiable variables. The person you're contemplating marrying must have two variables that are essential, as close to essential as it gets. If you're missing one of these, you're in deep trouble. I'm not talking about things that are unimportant or trivial. I'm talking about things that are subjective. For example, should you make an effort to marry somebody who's healthy? That's negotiable. Some people need that and some people don't need that. When I was in yeshiva, uh, I remember I would see a young woman. She was taken to uh, for medical treatment a couple times a week. And after a few months, she she passed away. And I went to see the 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 young man who was married to her. And he told me, that four years before, when they first met, she told him that she had terminal cancer. And they got married anyway. And he said it was the most wonderful four years of his life. No regrets. And now he's looking to get married again. Not everybody can do that. You have to be a big person in order to do that. <clears throat> but it's negotiable. Some people can handle it. Some people can handle that. What else is negotiable? Here's a young man trying to choose a girl to marry. What about her mom? Some girls come with mothers who are nice and others come with mothers who need to find a place to park their broom when they visit. But that's negotiable. And if you, if you need a loving set of in-laws, then that's what, that's what you need. Yes, for sure, for sure. So, uh, sorry, a couple more comments. No question, no question. Yes, when, when a woman gives birth, again, in a very high way and are, are attuned correctly spiritually, and you should give birth that way. And that is a throwback to the level of Eve before the sin. And so the young lady who just, who just asked this question, um, may I suggest to you, you find a marriage partner very soon and experience such a birth. Um, instead of becoming a Buddhist nun, go and find a, a nice Jewish man and see if you can fulfill that mitzvah. I like, uh, I would like to come to your wedding one day and see if you can make that happen for me instead of um, our wonderful conversations on Buddhism that we have. Okay. <clears throat> Above the red line are the non-negotiables. They're the non-negotiables and below are negotiables. When I say non-negotiables, by the way, I'm not talking about absolutes. To make a full scheme, it would be like this. Red line, Okay. Above the red line, two non-negotiables. Above the non-negotiables are the absolutes. For example, when a young man is ready to get married and starts his search, she needs to be a female. Okay, as I tried to explain before, she needs to be Jewish as well if he's Jewish. And if they're not Jewish, you should find somebody who is not Jewish. So I tried to explain before, and, and I'm sure that you're aware of this, that you can have a fantastic relationship with somebody who's not Jewish but that would not be Kiddushin if you are Jewish and the person is not Jewish. That would not be Kiddushin. The reason is, of course, not because of prejudice against non-Jews. Of course not. But because Jewish marriage is a reconstitution of an original spiritual oneness. The Gemara says that Adam and Eve, by the way, they weren't Jewish. The Gemara says that Adam and Eve, and to a, greater, to a certain degree, every husband and wife are fused in the back in the spiritual world. There's no back, only two faces. And then the Kabbalistic process that I'm sure you all know, which is called Nisira. Nisira means the tearing apart. They're separated and brought to the world to find each other and fuse face to face. When a husband and wife are together physically in this world, you fuse that original oneness face to face. A very holy act. And what's the meaning of this idea? Being fused back to back means that there's no back. Back is always, again, the side of danger, darkness, non-visibility, unrecognizability, excretion. In Hebrew, the word acher, which means strange, is the same word as achor, which means back. This is why the dark side of things is always called the backside. Comments, sorry. Converts. Converts are 100% Jewish. The greatest Jews in history were converts. The great-grandmother of the Messiah, of King David, was Ruth. She was a convert. A convert is a soul that got lost in Jewish history. That's all. They got lost in history. <clears throat> That's all it is. And by the way, they ended up finding their way back. No prejudice at all against converts and no prejudice at all against people who are not Jewish. But these are two people who were destined, named for each other in the spiritual world, 
torn apart, and that's why you long to get married. That's why you long to get married. The Gemara says the reason you want to get married is your longing for the part of yourself that you lost. You can only long for something that you're missing. Why would you long for something that you have no relationship with? You can only long for something that you've lost. Yes, Liba, you're right. I don't want to go into that, but you are correct. Um, uh, Myrna, the reason you're not able to see other comments is because a lot of people decide to write private comments for whatever reason. Okay, let's assume the basics are there. Okay, you're male, she's female. You're both Jewish. I'm not talking about non-Jewish marriage. Again, that is another discussion, and it is an incredibly holy subject. It's a mitzvah for non-Jews to produce children. But here we're talking about two Jews. You're looking for the part of yourself that you lost, the male and female complementary opposite halves that bond together to make a fertile union. It's a reconstitution of what you're missing. By the way, what happens if their absolutes are missing? For example, let's say that you find this girl. You're a male, she's a female, but she cannot have children. What does a Jewish girl do if she's not fertile? Let's say, let's say it's known that she has a genetic issue or she's born without a, a womb, whatever it is, without ovaries. So it's a fascinating issue. And this needs obviously a separate discussion. Part of the midst of a man, as we said, is to marry. And part of that is to have children. There's a mitzvah to produce children. And of course, the woman fulfills that when she marries as well. So the mitzvah to have children, technically speaking, is to have at least two, or a bit more accurately, um, a boy and a girl. I'm getting different private... uh, Okay, we have to please... Yes, 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 all your comments. Okay, I have to stay on topic here. Um... Again, it's, it, the mitzvah is not to produce children, okay? The mitzvah is not to produce children. It's to love intimately, correctly, in such a way that children can be produced. That's the mitzvah. Whether God gives you children or not, that's his business. He might give you one child, he might give you 12. That's his business. Your mitzvah is to marry and live in a way that is normal, marital, intimate relationship, That's what your obligation is. There's no mitzvah, for example, to use technology. There's no mitzvah to use lab-aided assistance. Of course, it's permitted. You do it and you have children. Great, you fulfill the mitzvah of having children. But that's not what's required. What's required is to find somebody. Now, what if you find a partner who cannot have children? What does somebody like that do? A young lady came to see me a couple years ago and told me that I was born without ovaries. I have a womb, but no ovaries. I cannot conceive. May I marry a young man? So she said, I want to, right? She wants to set up a Jewish home. And can I tell the young, the young gentleman that we can take an egg from another woman, for example, and maybe he'll fertilize the egg and we'll implant the egg inside of her womb. And therefore she'll carry the pregnancy, right? She said, I'll be the mom to the child in that way. Will he fulfill his commandment to have children in that way? And she said, if you tell me, Brian, who's going to marry me? Right? That, that's right. Again, it's a very anguished question. Surrogacy is a, is a long discussion. Maybe we could go into that another time. But surrogacy, using the egg of one woman and the womb of another, is not ideal in Judaism. I'm not saying it's forbidden. It's, it's done very often. But there are many interesting requirements it's not necessarily encouraged. There are other options. However, if surrogacy is done, then of course you have all sorts of questions. The main question, of course, is who's the mom? Who's the mother? Uh, okay. Who's the mother? Woman A gives an egg to woman B. Woman B's husband fertilizes the egg. Woman B carries the pregnancy. But it's genetic material of an egg derived from woman A. When Mrs. B gives birth to the child, who's the mother? That's not a subtle question halakhically. In fact, we take a a stringency on both sides. You might be interested to know the Israeli government has taken the view that when a baby is born like that, a a surrogacy situation, which happens very often, about 15% of children 
in Israel are born of some form of other IVF technique, not always from sur surrogacy, but about one in six couples have difficulty conceiving, and it's carefully measured in Israel. And that number is about one in six. The Israeli government has taken the view that we ought to register both women as the mother. Such children are raised with two legal mothers. What's the rationale behind this? It's a very good rationale. Since under Israeli law, like in most Western countries, it's illegal to marry a sibling, and we may not be sure who, who your siblings are if only one was the mother, right? Are the siblings derived from woman A or woman B? If you define both women as the legal mother, then you're automatically make it illegal to marry siblings from both sides, which is a very good solution. And that's what's done today. <clears throat> okay, I'm getting a question here about a sperm donor. Okay, so if the sperm donor is Jewish or not, it makes no difference whatsoever. If the woman delivering the baby is Jewish, the baby is Jewish. Actually, in fact, it's more desirable to find a non-Jewish sperm donor, a non-Jewish donor. Probably applies to eggs as well, but I'm not going to go into the reason for that. But if the sperm donor is not Jewish, <clears throat> then the baby is Jewish anyway. It makes no difference to the child's Jewish status, whether the father was or wasn't Jewish. And therefore, there's no problem. Who's the father? The sperm donor, obviously, and the sperm donor, the, right? The sperm donor is the father. Okay, so this is another whole issue. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's not our subject today. And maybe we can, we can uh, come back and talk about artificial uh, fertility on a future occasion, if you like. So let's go back to the main theme. You found somebody. You're male, she's female. You're both Jewish. As far as you know, you can both have children, Okay. Then you come to two non-negotiable items that you, need to, that you need to search for. So let me try to cover these. The first one, let me ask your opinion. I'll give you five seconds. What's the first thing you should consider when dating someone with a view to marriage? What's the first thing you should be looking for? Five seconds to type it into the box. The first thing I think would be Chemistry. Chemistry. Ah, very good. Very good. Uh, honest person. Similar values, temperament. Very good. Very, we'll get to those. Very good. I think the first thing that you should be looking for is chemistry. They need to be attractive to you physically and personality. It, it is, obviously, it isn't only physical and sensual attraction. It's also personality. You click. You can spend half an hour together without saying anything and feeling comfortable. The person appeals to you, you appeal to them. There's a mutual attraction on a level of physicality, charm, personality. The reason I put this first is not because it's the most important. It's not at all the most important thing in marriage, but it's the easiest thing to register early on. You can, within a very short time, know whether you're attracted to somebody or not. Maybe not the first meeting. Maybe, maybe you meet them a couple of times and their charm grows on you. That's possible. You see an inner light and they appeal to you. That's fine. But if you meet the person a number of times, you've dated this person a few times, five, six, whatever it is, and you just find them physically offensive, you wouldn't want to be close to them. That's not a good option for you. Um, yeah, for sure. All your comments are correct. Yes. Uh, marriage can be difficult, you know, in the best of times. And you need, ev you need everything that you can get to help you out. And therefore, highly, highly recommended. First on the list, make sure that there's a chemistry, a compatibility. So this is not, th this isn't only common sense. It's not only years of experience that has shown us this. It's a religious requirement. You know, in the Gemara, the Talmud says, for example, that a man should not contract a marriage with a woman without first seeing her. And Chazal say the reason is because if you don't see her and then you get married and then you come within close proximity and you find something that's offensive to either one of you physically, let's say, you'll have trouble fulfilling the mitzvah of loving your friend as yourself. And that applies, again, that applies to your wife as well. And therefore, there has to be a mutual attraction. So that's the first one, I think. 
So this is not a question of uh, logical uh, proposition, by the way. This is a question of taste. You may not be attracted to someone, and the per next person may be attracted to that, to that person. So this is obviously all personal taste. So, um, and again, obviously this is important in both directions. Classically, when it comes to the physicality, it's more important to men. As we know, men are more superficial in this area. Usually physicality is more often important to a man. By the way, why is it that men are more superficial in this area? Because the Talmud tells us time and again that women, as I began this discussion, have a natural sense of the meaning of a relationship. They, they descend to the level of meaning and depth in a relationship much more naturally than men do. As the Talmud puts it so beautifully, women appreciate the togetherness of two in a much more natural and deep way than men do. And that's something that we trust a woman to understand and to know. But attraction is important, obviously, in both directions. She also clearly has to feel an attraction to him. So I'll tell you a story. One night there was a knock at the door and a young lady was standing there, very anxious. She comes in and says, I'm getting married next week. What's the problem? I'm not physically attracted to the guy I'm about to get married to. He's going to be the perfect husband. He's a wonderful young man. And I agreed to become engaged to him because he's so great and I admire him greatly. He's the perfect guy. I'm just not physically attracted to him. In fact, I find him a little offensive physically. And I've been ignoring it up until now. What should I do? So I said that you need to have a seat and think about it carefully right now. And you make a decision tonight. You either call it off with all the pain that's involved or you decide to marry him and you ignore the issue and you never look back. So she sat at the table agonizing for a long time and she decided to go ahead. They got married. They also got divorced on their wedding night because she was unable to go home with him. And that's where the marriage ended. Not good. Okay, so... <clears throat> So again, so, so this, obviously, the physical attraction needs to be mutual. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, if you pay attention to your looks while you're dating, you need to pay attention after you're married as well. Here's a young man, and he's dating. And you know he's dating, because for the first time in 18 years, he's wearing a clean shirt, and he smells like a flower. Okay, now he gets married, and he gradually starts changing shape, uh, no, that's not respectful. It's not respectful. If you're in shape, fit, healthy, looking good while you're dating, you need to pay attention after you're married. Otherwise, you're, you're selling false goods. That's false advertisement. Um, right? We say, yeah, of course, of course, that happens all the time. Uh, we say, lovely um, azniach. You may not neglect your looks. I'll never forget one, uh, one great rabbi. A young lady came to uh, see me and she was struggling to find a partner. And this young lady had a policy of making her so herself look unattractive. She was naturally very beautiful and she didn't want a guy to want her for her looks only. So she actually went out of her way to make herself, she tried to make herself look unattractive. And again, she didn't want to get married for her looks. So she took great effort to make herself look very plain. So she used to come see me, and, and then she went and saw this great rabbi who I happened um, to be pretty close with. And after he saw her, he offered me just one short sentence. He said to me that it's, it's pretty obvious that she's neglecting her looks. And then he gave me that wonderful responsibility to call her out on it in a tactful way, obviously, and point it out. And when it didn't matter that it came to, for me, but when she heard that, you know, this rabbi said, said that she respected him and, and, um, she took care, good care of herself. And, you know, obviously, you know, when people saw that she started caring about herself, they started caring about her and she happened to have gotten engaged fairly quickly after that. Anyways, taking care of yourself is important, but it's important after marriage too, not just dating. And therefore young men who are listening to this, if you are, right, if you're listening to this recording, if you're making yourself look neat and clean and attractive before marriage, for the rest of your life, you need to do the exact same thing. You don't quit going to the gym or eating healthy. Rav Shlomo Zalman Orbach, one of the great sages of the last hundred years, he would, well after he was 80 years old, he would walk up the stairs to his apartment with a student and he would stop and he would fix his coat and his, 
he would brush his beard, and he would make himself look neat. And the student said, Rabbi, do you have guests in your home? He said, no, but my wife's home. He's over 80 years old. He's making sure that he looks that he looks good and cool for his wife. Ladies, let me point this out as well. If you're listening to this and, um, and you want to get married, I, I think that this is important. And if you are married, I think this is important. If you make yourself look stunning while you're dating, you need to look even more stunning when you're married. It's not right to make yourself look stunning when you date and then you get married and then you look like something that the cat dragged in. Can't do that. And by the way, while I'm on the subject, ladies, let me point out, uh, some Jewish ladies, when they go out on the street, they look gorgeous, stunning. But when they come home, you don't care how you look? No, a Jewish woman in the street should look normal. And at home, for her husband, she, look, she should look gorgeous. Who are you trying to impress? You want to look stunning? That's beautiful. Home is the place to do that. That's the Jewish vision of marriage. You're beautiful for your husband, not for other people. Yeah, for sure, Mirna. Okay, so that is in regards to physical attraction. One more thing about chemistry is this. How attractive, uh, how attracted do I have to be? The person walks in, you see him for the first time. How attracted do you have to be? Do you have to get that life-threatening asthma? No. I would say, uh, I would say a mild breathlessness, at least. A little breathless, maybe. Feel those butterflies. It's got to be above the red line of neutrality. That's how we'll put it. Um, above the red line, you feel attracted to the person. Below the red line, you find them offensive. And the red line is, is neutral. Uh, it, it should be better than neutral. How much better? That's not so important. That's up to you. Age changes you, by the way. Pregnancy changes you, but it needs to be a positive feeling when you meet the person. Okay, so far so good. May I please move on beyond chemistry? Okay, so you found someone who is the right gender and the right Jewish attitude, meaning that you got to be on the same page. If one of you is religious and one is not interested, that's obviously a recipe for trouble. Uh, again, you don't need to be on the same level religiously, but you need to be headed in the same direction. One can be very knowledgeable, a religious person, and the partner can be a rank beginner, could be a white belt. That's fine. As long as you're moving in the same direction, you're enthusiastic about the same things. Again, one can teach the other, that's fine. But if one is unmotivated, one is, one is on, the la on the ladder moving down, right? While the other one is on the ladder moving up, you're going to have some tension. So then that would need to be resolved. You can't get married until religious outlook is similar. And let me say something to, to those of you who, who may not be so religiously committed who are listening. Again, nobody who's here live, obviously. But to those who may be listening, the more religious of a partner you choose, the better your chances are at a successful marriage. Because the more religious a person is, the more they'll pay attention to you and not other ladies. I'm not saying that there aren't perfectly moral uh, atheists out there and non-religious people, but the numbers show that people who are actually more religious tend to not cheat as much. So the more sensitive they might be to your beauty because they're also not looking at other women, as opposed to the girl at the office who dresses like she's about to take a bath. So if he's religiously oriented and his focus is on family, and by the way, he's not allowed to be alone with another woman if he's an Orthodox Jew. You have a you have yichud. You're not allowed to be alone with opposite sex, right? You have a much better chance at making a successful marriage without other potential distractions. So, by the way, no guarantees. Obviously, the divorce rate in the religious world, by the way, is climbing at an alarming rate. But there are there are there are many problems in the religious world today. Obviously, but it's still vastly better than the secular world. In the religious world, at least, people want to get married. In the secular world, why should a man get married in the secular world today? He has all the privileges of marriage without the obligations. That's a big problem. Full-on relationships, he can live with the girl for years. I happened to deal with a couple who met when they were 18. They lived together for 11 years. 11 years, met at 18. And at 29, at 29 years old, she mentioned marriage. He left. He left. What do you mean marriage? I wasn't thinking of marriage. 
So she gave him the best years of her life and full commitment. He was just taking advantage and enjoying the relationship. Not good. So the more religious your principles, the more you have a chance at having a long lasting traditional family relationship that you'll want. Choice is yours, but it's, um, but it's a good reason. So let's move on to the next point. You've met the girl. She's got all the requirements and you're attracted to her. What's the next variable um, above the red line? What's the next variable? By far the most important thing, any offers, what would you say? You said it before, one of you said it before, character, right? Raw character. Uh, what we call midos, raw character. Who is the person? What's the raw human material? We're not talking about taste, by the way. Loyalty is a manifestation of character. So I would go, I, I would go deeper than loyalty. And I would say that it requires good character. We're talking about somebody kind, affectionate, loving, uncomplicated. And that's why the Talmud says, if you want to know the nature of a person, look how they treat animals, not people. Look how they treat animals. Above all else, good and kind pe uh, person. That's what you're looking for. If you're choosing somebody who's tightly wound, psychopathic, uh, twisted and bitter, then you're probably going to be in trouble. Unless, of course, you're also psychopathic and twisted. Then you'll be fine. Yeah, Myrna, we're going to get there. Yes, for sure. <clears throat> so did you guys hear... Uh, did you guys hear about the masochist and the sadist who got married? A sadist and a masochist get married. That's a perfect marriage. As soon as the door closes and they were alone together, the masochist said to the sadist, hurt me. And the sadist said, no. That's a perfect marriage. That's a perfect marriage. If that's you, if that's you, you'll be fine. Otherwise, what you're looking for above all else is giving. Giving. Above all else, giving. Takers will only be with the giver because they know they could take advantage. You need to be careful as a giver to only look for givers, right? You want a giver. Two people give to each other, each trying to make the other one happy, each concerned about their obligations and not their rights. I did a, we did a whole talk on obligations versus rights. Um, anyways, you'll have an idyllic relationship. Two people anxious about their rights and what you owe me, that's how you get civil war. When you live in a society where all you have are your rights, your rights, your rights, not your obligations and what you can do for others, problematic, really problematic. And therefore, let me say it again. People, people say to me, I need to find somebody, for example, who has a good sense of humor. I don't know. I don't know. Not necessarily. I need somebody who's super intelligent. Um, God, the amount of women who have said to me, I need somebody who's super intelligent. Why? Why? I can show you two people with two unbelievable academic degrees, highly intelligent people whose personal lives are in shambles. But I could also show you people who are not academic, right, in the least, but they've got wisdom in their hands and they know how to make the relationship work. I asked a girl why she wanted a super intelligent partner, which is which is how she put it, a super intelligent person. She said, I need to marry somebody who's super intelligent so we can have what she said, DNMs. What are DNMs? Deep and meaningful conversations. So I know young ladies who who tell their um, who tell me they're they're going to stay up all night with their husbands having deep and meaningful conversations. I hate to be the one to break the news to you, uh, but from the day you get married, you'll never have another deep and meaningful discussion with your spouse. <laughs> what are you going to talk about that's deep and meaningful? Again, you already know the way that you think. You know how you think. Are you going to sit up all night discussing Southeast Asian geopolitical whatever? I, right? Who does that? And therefore, academic intelligence, not necessarily important. If it's important to you, then it's important, right? And that's a negotiable. But you need to respect the person, obviously, for their intelligence. That's fine. You need to intellectually be stimulated as well, for sure. But again, it's not universally required. Common tastes, people tell me. I need to have the same, right? We need to share tastes. Who cares if you have common tastes? If you like Italian and he likes Thai, who cares? What's the difference? The best marriage I ever saw uh, were of two people who were totally dissimilar, um, even in emergencies. Whoa, sorry, I have a lot of comments here. One second. 
Yeah, yes. Yeah, I'm going to get to all that. Yes, for sure. Yes, Leva. <clears throat> the best marriage I ever saw was, was people who were completely dissimilar. The man was the most logical engineer. Even in emergencies, he was only, only logic-based. And the wife was completely and totally artistic, as granola as you get, opposite character, totally. But they had amazing respect for each other, amazing admiration for each other's talents and abilities. And the children saw them. And the children always said that my parents come first for each other. The children in that home, they told me that they never saw the parents have a personal argument, a personal argument. What does that mean? That means that you can have arguments. That's totally fine, but never personal. Let me say this again. In a marriage, you may never make a personal comment. Never. Personal insult? Absolutely not. If you need to correct your spouse, it has to be done respectfully. A personal insult? That should be unthinkable. Absolutely, completely out of the question. How should a husband criticize his wife? Very carefully. I'll give you an example. A man comes home. He hasn't eaten since Tuesday last week. He's starving. And his wife, he worked hard all day. His wife's a housewife and she forgot to, to make dinner. So at the last minute, she warms up some cabbage from two weeks ago, also forgetting that he happens to be allergic to cabbage. Picture this scene. So you know what happens. The cabbage ends up all over the ceiling, right? No, of course not. That's not what you do. Eat the cabbage. Who cares if that you're allergic? That's what she produced for you. This is what she gave you. And if it weren't for her, you'd be living in a lonely apartment eating a cold can of peas and using the yellow pages as a tablecloth. So you eat the cabbage. Well, now you've got to say something, right? She might do that again. Nope. Nope. But nobody would be able to stand for that again, right, Brian? No, this is what you do. You wait a couple days until she makes your favorite dinner and you say, you know what, darling? This is even better than the cabbage. And then she'll get the message in a loving way. Personal insult? Mm-mm. Never. This is the most important person in the world. All right, let me say something else. Do you know that in a Jewish marriage, you should not ask your spouse to do a favor unless you know that they would consider it to be a, priv a privilege? Darling, could you please drop my shoes off at the whatever? Excuse me, she's not your servant. You could pay somebody to do that. Let's say the President of the United States comes to your house. And on his way out, you say to him, Mr. President, I know you'll be driving by my dry cleaners. Would you mind dropping off my suit? Nope. He's far too important for that. Well, you know what? Your husband's too important for that too. And your wife is more important than that. You don't ask them to do menial favors for you unless, you know, they consider it an act of love then you may. Again, you're talking about royalty. You're talking about your husband. You're talking about your wife. Absolutely, you can't ask them to do things. But again, you are so in love and know that every act is an act of loving kindness that of course you should be able to do that. <clears throat> again, it's all total respect. And if you have a little fracture in your relationship with your boss, that can be fine. You can survive that. But not if it's with your spouse. By the way, never go to bed without at least a chilly good night, <laughs> no matter how bitterly you've been arguing. Because if you don't, it just festers. Again, there's so much to talk about here. <clears throat> Do you know that in the, in the first year of marriage, there's a Jewish law called Shana Rishona. That means for the first year of marriage, a man is not allowed to leave his wife's side for anything. Not even if he's in the army and they need him. The Torah says if you're in the army and it's your first year of marriage, you go home. You don't go out to war. First year of marriage, you stay with your wife. What's the reason for this, by the way? Because it takes a year for a man to prove to his wife that she's the most important thing in the world to him. By the way, most modern rabbis today say today probably takes about 10 years. And if you're running eight minutes late, you call her. You let her know. If it was a business meeting, by the way, of course you'd call ahead if you're running late. Why wouldn't you call your wife that you're running late? She's more important than any business meeting you'll ever have. You're in a meeting. You're negotiating a deal worth millions of dollars and your phone rings. 
what do you do? Most people will say, I'll call you back. Absolutely not. She's your wife. You should say, uh, gentlemen, my wife is, is on the call. You can all wait a couple of minutes. And you know what? Answer the phone and let her hear you say that. We're talking about absolute respect over here. There's no, qu- there's no question. Yes, absolutely. The wife should be sensitive too. Yeah, that's for sure a good point. But again, we're, the point here that I'm trying to make is absolute respect. So this is the most important person in the world. The blessing comes to your home through your wife and the way you treat her. And the wife needs to treat her husband like a king. What's a huge mistake amongst the men? Taking their wives for granted. What's the most, uh, what's the wife's most common mistake? Quite often you'll hear nagging. Again, that's not right. uh, That's not the right psychology. You nag a husband, you'll drive him crazy. You want a husband to do something for you? Don't nag him. The way you do, the way you do this, have an hour before he comes home, make yourself look good, have the children in pajamas waiting to greet him by the door in height order, have the dog waiting with his slippers in his mouth. When he walks in the door, you look at him with admiring eyes, like a conquering hero, and you carry him to his easy chair, and you massage his feet, and you bring him a whiskey. That's how you treat a man. (laughs) And after he's shed the cares of the day, then you make your request. Understand the psychology. Anyway, these are some important rules uh, for for marriage. Um, All right, now for some of the so I have to scroll and to get back to some of the comments that I was missing. Okay. Are there any comment? All right. Do you? Have, okay. Got it. Any words of encouragement for those of us who are looking to get married? Okay. Um, so I think that maybe you should contact somebody who sensible, somebody who may know you. And that person, right, we call them Shadchanim, they can introduce you to somebody who, who's sensible. And um, once you meet that person, then you can send that person to me. And I'll tell, I'll, I'll tell them these rules. And um, um, by the way, as JLIC educators, one of the things that Sandra and I, right, when people are about to get married, um, you, you get help. You go through these classes, you meet a few times before you get married. And you focus on these classes regarding to the laws of Tarat Mishpacha, the marital, the marital laws. Like I said, you, you want to look for character. How do you know? One important thing is looking at, at a person's background potentially. Sometimes a person's family can be a little deceptive. Sometimes the family could be very eye-opening in terms of their background, right? Do they have loyal friendships? Do they have fractured or broken um, or anguished backgrounds? Right, go visit people who are important in their lives. Sometimes visiting parents might be good. Sometimes visiting parents can be the opposite. But again, you're dating this young lady, and let's say you go and you and you see her home. And if you walk into the home, and there's soft music playing, and um, and the parents or her parents are 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 sitting there and they're calm, that's very good. But if there's blood on the walls and human bones laying around, that potentially could be a red flag. Um. Sorry, one second. So I've got about 25 comments that I have not read yet, which is what it's telling me. Sorry, I, I can't read everything right now. Um, but many people, again, many people quite often repeat the ways of their families, right? Quite often abused come, right, become abusers. So this is a well-known problem. And of course, there are exceptions, obviously. I'll give you one classic exception, the, the, the Balchuva. I'll tell you a classic pattern that we see time and time again. The young person grows up, <clears throat> a young person grows up in a very broken family with anguish and pain and, and acid uh, relationships, and they're angry at their parents, and they become religious, and, and we see a remarkable shift. Instead of looking at parents with anger, They start looking at parents with pity. If only the parents had a more authentic Jewish education and respect and love, they never would have gone into that. And then they end up modeling themselves on a religious couple whom they, who they admire. Then they, then they see respect and the love and the rules that are followed in such relationship. And that shifts them radically. Okay. The second thing, there's so much to talk about. Perhaps I'll just say this. The, the second thing that you need 
is enough time, enough time, enough time to get to know the other person. So this rapid dating for two weeks or three weeks, nope. Definitely not if you come from a secular background. Definitely not. If you come from a deeply religious background, that might be acceptable. I, I know, um, I remember um, a young man who was raised in Geula, ultra-Orthodox Hasidic Jerusalem suburb, uh, right? 300 years of his family davening in the same shul. And he, I remember he told me he got married and then he told me a similar story about his grandparents, his grandparents. So again, this is over 20 years ago when I was in uh, yeshiva in Israel. He said that when he was 18, his father walked in and, and said to him in Yiddish, Nachum, put on your Shabbos clothes. And he said, why dad? And then he said, "Never mind." So he gets dressed and he puts on his Shabbat outfit and his father walks him across Geula to a house in Mea Sharim, which is the next neighbor, uh, next ultra orthodox neighborhood order uh, over. And his father said, "Go say hello to your kala. Go say hi to your bride." He said hello, and everybody said Mazel Tov. And the men had a party in one room, and the women had a party in another room, and that was the engagement. And then the father said, "Go say goodbye to your kala." He said goodbye, and then the father said, "No, not her. Her. She's your kala." He said, "Oh, okay, sorry. Her. Okay, goodbye." Um, and that was the uh, the only time that they met before they got married. They agreed. They met. They liked one. They liked the look of one another. The parents asked them, "Are you happy to get married?" Both of them said yes. And they're both coming from a culture where he'll be just like his father, and she'll be just like her mother. And their their families have been praying together in the same communities for the last three hundred years. What's the problem with that? There won't be any comparisons. There was no dating beforehand. There's been no intimate relationship in the past to make comparisons about. They're married. The next time they meet was under the chuppah. So the story is an interesting. The story has an interesting ending, by the way. For many years, they weren't able to have children. They weren't able to have children, and then they went to go see the great Chazon Ish, the great saintly rabbi in Bnei Brak. Again, he died around the year 1954. So he gave them a bracha for Chai Banim Chaim. They, that they should have 18 living children. They ended up having 19. And if you come from an ultra-religious background where you are both raised the exact same way, no need to date for a while. But if you come from a superficial background where movies taught you um, what you know about relationships, then you probably need more time. Most people listening to this need more time, I would imagine. How much time? Uh, enough time to get to know the person in all circumstances. This is a, a good place to end with this thought. Um, invite the young man to your home and have your little sister pour some soup on his lap, get the dog to bite him, close the door on his fingers, and see how he behaves under pressure. <laughs> I'm joking, obviously. You need enough time to see the person and know... The response is to different situations. You can't get married and say, I want a lot of children, and then he wants to be sterilized. You can't do that. You can't do that. I'll give you a rule of thumb. When you know the person well enough to know that one more meeting is not going to change your knowledge about them at all, at that point, when you're not going to learn anything new about the person, break up or get engaged. That's it. There's no timeline. It's Date until you know another date won't teach you anything that you don't already know about the person. If that's six months, if that's one year, if that's two years, there's no number on that. Once you get to that point, you break up or you get engaged. It's very simple. Otherwise, all you're doing is you're prolonging the pain. I'll say it again. You've dated long enough to know what the person is like under all circumstances and you know their world their worldview, you understand them well. And you know another date is not going to give you any new insight or information. You've got all the information. At that point, you take a long walk and you make a decision. You break up or you get engaged. Again, there's obviously a lot more to say, but I think um, I've tried to give a broad overview. So these are just some of the rules about uh, choosing someone. Anyways, I want to wish you all a wonderful Shabbat and looking forward to seeing you all next week.